welcome to yet another episode of Bits to Billions, the unicorn story. Summer vacations are coming to an end. Schools have reopened across the country. I'm delighted about that as a parent. But guess who else is happy? Our guest on the show today, Sumit Mehta, the founder and CEO of uh, LEAD, one of India's EdTech unicorns. And what LEAD essentially does is it provides hardware solutions software solutions to make uh, the education experience learning outcome better in schools. Sumit, are you happy about schools reopening? Couldn't be happier. I mean, the last two years have been really tough for our students uh, because we've always believed that the right place of a student is in the classroom. They had a really Not tough time. Not in front of Zoom. I mean, students find it really tough to be in, the front, in front of a screen for eight hours, right? Uh, and teachers had, had it tough too. So to have students, teachers back in the classroom is music to our ears. LEAD helps school classrooms use online learning tools and works with thousands of affordable private schools in tier 2 and 3 cities. This involves tracking teacher and student progress, managing school operations on the cloud and providing digital resources to make learning more engaging. It provides tech-based solutions to schools, teachers, and aims to improve learning outcomes for children. Founded by Sumit Mehta and Smita Diora in 2012, the company started with running affordable schools and teaching middle school students. It built its technology solution in 2017, which is now also seeing traction led by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has turbocharged the movement to online learning. It recently raised $100 million at a valuation of $1.1 billion, catapulting it to the coveted unicorn club of internet startups. Sameet, what is the main pain point that you see in the way education happens today at schools and why do you think it needs to change? See, if you think about it, uh, in the last 75 years of our independence, the one uh, industry or one segment which has not innovated is schools. We still teach the traditional way. Classrooms are still lecture halls. Students still learn from textbooks. All our information has moved to multimodal, but schools are still single mode, lecture based, rote learning. And I believe that you know, if schools don't transform, our students will not be able to achieve their true potential. And if our students don't achieve their true potential, India is not going to achieve its true potential. So I know the, the mission is bold. But I think it is absolutely necessary that someone takes the cudgel of transforming schools. So essentially what you're saying is students have been trained to memorize, but not to acquire skills to be able to think uh, and understand concepts. Is it? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, you know, everybody who we interview today, we look for communication skills, we look for collaboration skills, we look for thinking skills. But in schools, we focus on memory. And that's the big gap that schools have to bridge. And LEAD is playing a significant role in transforming schools so that we can build these five skills among students. Right. And even the schools that you're looking at, these are not, you know, some posh schools in Mumbai or Bangalore uh, or Chennai uh, leading ICSE schools or CBSE schools. You have a very specific target in mind. T tell us about that. See, I think it goes back to where does the majority of India study? The majority of India doesn't study in the posh schools. The majority of India lives in small towns. Hmm. It goes to affordable schools. And that's where the biggest transformation is needed. So if we want to make impact at scale, we can't be at the top 5%. We have to be at the 85% where majority of the country goes. Sumit, it's also interesting. I must say that this is actually the first Bits to Billions episode we are doing in Mumbai and not in Bengaluru, which is the tech hub. And interestingly, the EdTech hub as well. You have Vedantu and Unacademy and Baiju's and so on. But LEAD, you chose to build in bustling Mumbai. Why is that? See, I always say that people build companies for a mission, but they start companies for love. So I moved to Mumbai because my better half is from Mumbai. So huh. when we were moving back from Singapore for our kids, this was a great place. And our initial experiments in education began here. Our founding team was here. So now we have offices all over in, in Delhi, Bangalore, but our, uh, our core stays in Mumbai. Talking about better half, we are going to meet the co-founder, the co-CEO of uh, Leeds, Smita Diora shortly, who also happens to be Sumit's partner, both at home and in office. Let me introduce you to her. 
So how did you guys meet Sumit? Come, I'll tell you. Let's ask Smita only. It's going to be quite the interesting backstory. Hey, Smita. Hi. Welcome to Bits to Billions. Uh, so there you have it, Smita Diora, the co-founder, co-CEO of Lead, who happens to be Sumit's partner at office and at home. How did you guys strike a balance? This is interesting. I get asked this question <laughs> quite often. Uh, Sumit is uh, more of uh, ideas, big ideas, possibilities kind of person uh, and hence uh, and also from there comes a lot of creative thinking and creative ideas. I am uh, execution. I am very execution, great if we have this creative idea how do we bring it to life, what are all the different things that need to come together to bring it to life, uh, how do we pace it. Uh, and I think that's where uh, you know we, uh, we 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 sort of understand that about each other, uh, and and hence create space. And we also know that these are very complementary skills, and it helps. Uh, now, in the organisation, see our our roles have evolved over time. Hmm. You know, in hmm. the first four or five years, we did every, both of us did whatever needed to be done. Just like there a was, startup. Yeah. yeah, just like a startup, there was uh, an unsaid and a said thing on what's the priority for this week, what's the priority for this month, and who is best placed to do it and we would sort of divide and uh, conquer and on some things we would work together. So the metaphor I use is that you know Smita is the foundation of the organization so if you think of a tree hmm. she's the roots okay. she holds us solid hmm. and I'm the branches who which allows us to fly and I think that's that's the metaphor we use in the organization. So you have a solid foundation and nothing to worry about. Exactly <laughs> as long as Smita is there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> but you were going to tell us how you met. Uh, well, so uh, the real story or your story? <laughs> there are two versions. Yeah. <laughs> there are always two versions. Sumit always likes to make stories. So yes, <laughs> let's hear this. No, no, no. So both of us were in PNG. Uh, you know, she was the rich girl with the car. I was the poor guy <laughs> living in the story. Chamri and uh, <laughs> driving to office in local trains. So it began as uh, me asking for a lift in her car. That evolved to friendship, and then it this evolved is to. This so Bollywood. And, you know, <laughs> now I know why you're based in Bombay. <laughs> This is so many stories. <laughs> so what's the real yeah. story? So I think yeah, my version of the story, of course, is you know we uh, we, we we met at PNG through a common friend. Okay, so that part is true. And the part that we were driving together the, the is very true. The poor boy is also true. Of course. No, that is his adjective. I but did have a car. a car. I did have a car. So and uh, and yeah, he used to take the bus. So uh, so he told had, us the real <laughs> story <laughs> then. Yeah. I know so, yeah, but, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, you you create a good story. <laughs> well. <laughs> He had a nicer way of telling it, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, Sumit Spida, I must ask you both. Um, if I look at the other edtech unicorns in India, right, uh, all of them are in the space of um, after school learning, supplementary learning, uh, test prep for engineering and medicine and civil services and so on. But you actually decided to attack the root, not, you know, the branch, uh, so to say. You said that we will not work with students directly, but we will work with schools. Um, is it because it was a better model from a business point of view, because, you know, your revenue stream, your income stream is much more stable, or you felt like there was a bigger problem and a better problem to solve here, that, you know, the test market, the prep market is pretty saturated? What, what were your thoughts? See, I would actually go back to our genesis. We always saw that a child spends six hours in a school. Hmm. Uh, and five days a week. Five days a week and one hour, two hours in tuition, hmm. maybe two times a week. So if we have to make whole system transformation, whole child transformation, our karma bhumi has to be school. It hmm. cannot be tuition. And uh, I mean, if you, if you go back to our starting point, we actually started by running a school. Hmm. Right? Because it didn't even occur to us that we should do what we, what we call the banded you know tuitions are banded test prep is banded the core plumbing of a human being gets developed in a school 6 hours a day 5 days a week so if we have to really uh, think about systemic transformation i mean the natural answer is to work within school and transform them now i admit it is a harder battle it is a longer journey uh, but you know our thing was that for 75 years if nobody has done it somebody has to pick it up so why not us and so therefore, it never occurred to us to do tuitions, uh, test prep, online, uh, because we were very focused on uh, working from within and do whole system transformation. And now you're what present in, I mean, powering some 3,500 3, schools. Yeah. schools. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just add to what Sumit was saying that, I, you know, the honest answer also is, uh, as he said, that it never occurred to us to do something else. And, you know, as a founder, you normally, you know, there is some problem in the world that really bothers you. 
and you then get obsessed with trying to solve that problem. I think for us, the problem that was bothering us was uh, kids when they were uh, exiting school at grade 10, they just did not uh, have the right skills for them to be ready for success in life. So we never considered after school, we never considered test prep, none of those things. We just rolled up our sleeves, started a school hmm. and said, let's get started from here. We started a school in a village hmm. and we said, let's get started and then but we'll see how to build. you kind of learned that it's not enough if you start schools because there are only so many schools you can start. It will be much more effective if you work with schools that are already present in the country. Yeah. Which is why you kind of decided to evolve lead in that direction. There is a bit of serendipity in this, you know. We were running five schools and I recall there were a couple of schools in the nearby areas who reached out to us and said, we've heard good things about lead school. Can we use your system? Hmm. And at that point, both me and Smitha were thinking that we have committed our life to uh, working in education. So therefore, we want impact at scale. So if we continue opening our schools, we'll get to 60, 70 schools in our lifetime. And India has 1.5 million. So we're not even going to be a drop, drop in the ocean. In the ocean yeah. uh, so we then connected the dots and said, hey, you know, the system that we have developed, it's delivering good outcomes. Let's offer it to already existing schools and transform them. And maybe that's how we can really make impact at scale. When you're thinking about school as a complex ecosystem, you have to think of all stakeholders, the teacher, the principal, the student, the parent, the school owner and solve for everyone because even if one stakeholder is not solved, hmm. any solution will get rejected as an external organ. So we, I think the first time ever somebody has brought system thinking to schools and once you do that then the natural corollary is it has to be an integrated system where the actions that you want uh, in a great school automatically come out of that system. So whether it is, you know, how does a great school run, you know, there is spiral learning so after assessment you do remedials. How do great classrooms run? There, there's multimodal learning. There's audiovisual, there is kinesthetic, there is hmm. lecture. Hmm. How do parents get engaged? They need to have the information. How do students learn? It has to be differentiated. Now, how do you codify these practices into a system, hmm. enable it through technology, and make it like a one-stop shop, shop through an integrated system? So that's what we are implementing, and that's why it's hard to compare with anything that has happened before, because all of them were piecemeal solution based on linear, linear thinking. I think we just connect back from there that hey, LEAD will basically make every teacher an excellent teacher. You know, she'll be able to teach excellently just like some of the best teachers in the world do uh, through our system. Uh, you know, the outcomes that will be achieved with the students is they will become fluent with English language. Hmm. Uh, they will be able to speak confidently and, you know, uh, sort of present in front of uh, folks. Then they start getting intrigued and interested about how will that happen? Yeah. And then that's when we start unpacking, uh, you know, parts of our it. system in terms of how will it happen. Uh, you know, so I think it is, uh, it's about uh, working backwards from what are your customers' aspirations, what is it that they want for their child, and really connecting the dot backwards. Uh, versus going and saying, hey, you know, rote learning is not good, do this. I think at, at some uh, level, they, everyone knows rote learning is not good, but no one likes to talk about it. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> every school owner knows that, but they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to admit that rote learning is happening in my classroom. Right. You know? So, I remember when you guys became a unicorn uh, last year, you said Lakshmi has followed Saraswati. But now, if I look at the edtech space, Lakshmi is staying very far away. <laughs> and, you know, there are layoffs, there is restructuring, there is shutdown. What is it like to be an edtech in the current environment? And are these tough decisions that a lead also will have to take at some point? I think uh, what is happening in the larger edtech space is not surprising. Uh, there was an excess during COVID and there was an artificial blip which happened during COVID because schools were locked down, parents and children had time at hand and therefore they were resorting to online learning. I've always maintained that online education is not appropriate for kids below the age of 14 because they don't like to sit in front of a screen and uh, listen to somebody for four, five, six hours. So the right place of a child is in the classroom. And I also want to demarcate uh, the larger edtech from school edtech. I think LEAD belongs to school edtech, we work with schools. So in fact, our uh, trajectory is inverse to what is happening in consumer edtech. So when COVID was there, a lot of consumer edtech companies were growing. We, if you think about it, we grew despite COVID, not because of COVID. Now, once COVID is gone, uh, we're actually back to our strength, which is in school, in classroom learning. And for the last three months, we've had our best ever months. Uh, so, I've always said that, you know, when consumer edtech zigs, school edtech zags. Uh, mm -hmm. So, what you're seeing in consumer edtech, I, I don't think is relevant for, uh, for school edtech. Now, uh, once the 
the bubble kind of settles into what is a normalized acceptance of online education that's when you will see some consolidation uh, but school at tech i think as long as schools are open is going to be on an upward trajectory so me interestingly you come from a family of uh, teachers uh, did that kind of stoke your passion for teaching and education was that perhaps a starting point big time i think uh, my biggest inspiration in life has been my father i think he was a maverick teacher both in college <laughs> and at home so we would be sitting for dinner and he would pick up a chapati and break it and say if this is whole how much is this and we would say half and then he would say okay this is 1/4 then he would sometimes you know uh, in the evening cut an apple and say whole part so a lot of math how to make it concrete i think i learned from my dad how to visualize how to visualize uh, even in english uh, you know he used to people used to come from far off places to learn grammar from him because he had a way of teaching uh, grammar which connected to life so the whole idea of how do you connect learning to life actually give came from give us an example him. of that grammar so like for example he would say that you know uh, a big issue is uh, subject verb agreement right uh, on so he would take one word like i eat you eat he eats ram eats so he will continue building in and people would start to see how the verb is changing as the subject is changing but he had a knack of you know going from known to unknown so all these principles that you know now we have built into the lead curriculum i have heard it growing up how to go from known to unknown how to connect to life how to visualize hmm. uh, so yeah i think uh, education being a dinner table conversation while growing up definitely i think has helped in some way yeah talking about curriculum we have some of what you use at your school Frac uh, fractions and these are what to visualize this numbers is a, yeah this is a place value kit uh, so as uh, as kids grow up i think the concrete understanding of what a numeral means is very important because hmm. very often we start with writing 32 and 21 and hmm. a child doesn't know what 32 and 21 means So, so should I tell you how thirty-one? Why not? Okay. <laughs> so simple. I think uh, as I place these counters, these hmm. are ones. As I place, if you count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So these are ten ones, right? Hmm. Now a child should understand that when you add up ten ones, it basically is one ten. Correct. So I visually show him that the, you just counted ten ones. This is equal, right? Is yeah. this equal? Yeah. So can I call it one ten? Yeah. Now, if it is one ten, then you know two ten is twenty. Twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, and so on. So you then they understand that ten tens is a hundred, and actually this, if you look, is a hundred. So they have a concrete understanding of ones hmm. becoming tens, becoming hmm. hundreds. Now, when we are forming numbers, so let's take thirty-two. Can you form thirty-two out of these tens and so thirty and two? Two, and then can you form twenty-one? Twenty and one. And one. So now you have ones and tens. Hmm. If you have to add, just add the ones. Fifty-three. Um, three and fifty. Yeah. You're faster than a child. <laughs> but if you add the ones, it will become three ones, and then you add the tens, it is five tens. Yeah. yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, fifty-three. Now. once a child has a concrete understanding of this then when they go to abstract they can actually use the numerals and learn so me you know what you're trying to do this is something that international schools do as you said and you're trying to bring it to affordable private schools where the fee structure is much lower do you think they will be able to afford it at the price points you're offering uh, the price point at which we are able to offer this kind of education is is amazing right uh, i mean for like 10% of a school's fee which is like 3000 bucks a year you can actually get international level education in an affordable school mm. and you know because we are a tech first company we are different from traditional publishers and that's why if you look at uh, our curriculum whether it is the math curriculum or science curriculum or english language curriculum it's applicable to all boards till grade 5 after grade 5 when there are board level variations we can easily create it because from the digital modular background we can create uh, versions for the board so today we are actually able to serve almost all the boards in the country hmm. uh, and and with our uh, curriculum which is the combination of lesson plans and books right 
Um, Samit, you know, we were talking about how schools have reopened and how it's music to your ears. But one big concern that many people cited was, you know, the learning gap that children have. Um, only some children have actually had any form of learning in the last year. Even, even virtual learning hasn't been great. Uh, for the last two years, I've been crying at the top of my voice that WhatsApp forwards and, you know, sending PDFs is not equal to education. Uh, so, whatever is coming out in the National Assessment Survey or even ASSER is actually not a surprise because uh, we literally left the kids to their own devices. You know, we basically thought sending PDF documents or YouTube links uh, will give them learning. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, so now, if you understand the vertical progression in education, uh, you can easily create a bridge course which takes care of all the prerequisites that are required for a grade. So we created a bridge course for 12 days. Uh, students which who start in our bridge course start at about 45 to 48 percent. After the bridge course, in only 12 days, hmm. they move to 62 percent. Hmm. So we are able to cover a significant part of the learning gap in the first 12 days because it's designed to take care of the prerequisites. Right. Uh, so I, I think if people make well-designed interventions, the learning gaps can be closed in an accelerated manner. But if you don't, then they will continue and actually compound. Right. Academic society have also maintained that, you know, schools also serve other purposes. I mean, it's almost like childcare True. in a sense, right? Actually, when COVID hit, that's the first realization people had that so far everybody used to think that school is about education. The moment schools got locked down and that education moved online, parents took a back foot. And that's when educators realized that schools were actually doing three things. They were providing education, they were providing childcare, like a crash facility, <laughs> daycare. <laughs> and daycare. And the third thing was, you know, this social acclimatization is a very important role that school plays. Yeah. And that is why the moment COVID is behind us, parents are actually flocking and uh, kind of uh, climbing over each other to send <laughs> the kids back home because they also want their eight hours of, uh, you know, uninterrupted time, you know, people who are working or people who are at home. Our, our households are not designed to take care of kids 24 by 7. So yeah. schools play a very important social role. Smita, going forward, what other adjacencies do you see for LEAD? Right now you are in the affordable private school segment for English medium schools. Uh, do you see potential for regional languages? Do you see potential in other markets perhaps? developed markets that you know need such a product um, if you can tell us about your plans yeah. see i think firstly chandra we still only cater to one percent of the entire private school segment so if i even just look at india and within india school segments affordable schools is a very large segment then you know there are lower fee schools which is an equally large hmm. segment. There's partnership with government that, uh, you know, that we also see as a possible adjacency. So, Meet, you know, every founder these days is talking about how the focus has shifted from growth at all costs to profitability at all costs. Um, is that something that's going to be important for you as well? Because, you know, you're still loss making. So, is, that, is this an opportunity to perhaps shrink costs and focus on prof uh, profitability? See, if you think on how we build the company, we've always, uh, you know, despite what happens in the external market, the ups and downs, we've always been very focused on uh, solid unit economics and uh, growing profitably. So, I think right from the beginning, uh, I'm somewhat of a traditionalist. I don't understand negative gross margin businesses. Uh, so, I think positive unit economics is very important for us right from the beginning. Now. Any time is a good time to, you know, tighten your belts and look at where you're spending your money and, you know, cut out the flab and the fat in the company. And we would, of course, uh, all the time look at that. In terms of uh, profitability, if you look at it, right, the way we have designed our system is to be affordable for our schools and work mm. backward from mm. there. Uh, so at a certain scale, uh, you know, the, the contribution margin would be enough for us to defray our fixed costs. So as we hit the 8,000 to 10,000 school mark, we're going to be profitable even at the EBITDA level. So, for a business like ours, uh, you know, it is to be understood differently. It isn't a high CAC, negative gross margin business. So, it is only about a matter of time getting to a certain scale and becoming profitable. And we are well on track. I think in a couple of years, we will be EBITDA profitable. Right. You've both been running this startup, now Unicorn, together for 10 years now. Uh, do you see yourselves running it for the next 10 years, 20 years? You know, what's the desired end state for you? Is it going to be an IPO? Is it perhaps going to be part of a larger entity? I definitely always 
uh, imagined this to be or wanted this to be an institution that uh, stays uh, forever, lives far beyond uh, us as individuals and hence eventually yes IPO would be the right path. Uh, do we see someone acquiring it? Tough to say so now because <laughs> you know it really it's it's I think it's it's the mission with which we've built this not a lot of organizations are necessarily chasing the mission I, I guess like any mature founders at some point uh, you know we will realize that maybe there are other people who are better placed to run the operation and I think that would be the right time for me to sort of move away uh, as and when that happens actually if you if I honestly answer your question we've never seen the uh, milestones of our journey in uh, financial or investor metrics we've always seen it in impact metrics so internally also we always think about there are 270 million kids in this country we are reaching out to only 1.4 million by the end of this year we'll reach to 3 million right and I don't see us reaching 270 million in our lifetime so like Smita said I think we are building a company which is built to last which outlives us and therefore a really strong purpose driven culture so that even when we are not there the company is still delivering to the mission so if you ask me 10 years 20 years I think uh, lead is going to be one of those companies which are you know uh, in the pantheon of built to last or good to great which continues to work on this mission of bringing excellent education to every child uh, and if we are moving on that trajectory I do not see myself getting tired of it. Uh, because you know uh, when you are doing what you love uh, you basically wake up every day completely charged up. Uh, so I have not had a day where I am uh, struggling to get to work, I am actually struggling to go to sleep because there is so much more to do. Uh, so yeah I mean I do not have an end state, I, I see myself doing this uh, for a long time. Okay Sumit what is Smita's favourite subject? English. What is Sumit's favourite subject? Math. Smita your favourite city? My favourite city? Singapore. <laughs> Your favourite holiday? Oh, Antarctica. What does education mean to both of you? Uh, possibility. To make uh, capable adults, responsible citizens and good human beings. Sumit, your best moment as an entrepreneur? When we decided, almost decided to shut down LEAD uh, but then got a new lease of life and here we are. Smita, your lowest point as an entrepreneur? The lowest points are when I do not see students learning so I know that it is not working and I, I, and I need to do something different. If you are not running LEAD, what would you do, Smita? I would be running a school. Sumit? Uh, I would be teaching. One entrepreneur who you both look up to? Steve Jobs for me. Smita? Jeff Bezos, just the way he's built Amazon and the culture at Amazon. Thank you both very much for joining us on this 2 billion. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Sanjay.